Hello and welcome again to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. With me today is Dr Francis Knight, who is the Associate Professor of Modern Christian History. And she is going to introduce a very significant 19th century theologian, Spurgeon. Francis, why study Charles Haddon Spurgeon? Charles Haddon Spurgeon is a 19th century religious celebrity. He actually used the term celebrity about himself as early as the 1850s when he begins to rise to prominence. And certainly there's plenty of evidence that in the second half of the 19th century, he was regarded in Victorian society and also in America where he had a big impact as a celebrity. And I think that's an interesting fact in itself because we tend to think of celebrity as something which has been created in the last 20 years or so. We now can't move for celebrity in its various forms. But in the 19th century, there were celebrities who included people like Gladstone, Disraeli, Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, General Gordon, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a Baptist preacher. Why was he famous and what made him so desirable as a celebrity? <laughs> well, he was famous for his preaching. Uh, he had a tremendous capacity to move people by the power of his preaching. And also he must have had incredible technical virtuosity to be able to speak, obviously in a world without amplification and microphones, to um, groups of several thousand. He would quite uh, audibly preach to three or four thousand. Uh, so the experience of hearing him was a very important thing, which many were able to do. He preached in London at various uh, huge venues in London and finally at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, which was seen as the biggest, well, it was the biggest uh, place for religious worship at the time. And um, it used to be said, uh, Americans, in fact, used to say uh, when they came back from, or they were asked when they came back from trips to um, Britain, did you see the Queen, Queen Victoria? Possibly unlikely that they had seen the Queen. Did you hear Spurgeon? And it would have been more likely that they would have been able to hear Spurgeon. But you didn't just hear Spurgeon, you also read Spurgeon because his sermons were taken down by stenographers um, and in you know, a, a manner which would uh, sort of almost parallel, parallel in a way or pre is a forerunner to some of the uh, modern technological developments, uh, his sermons would be preached on a Sunday and would be available in print, I think by the Wednesday or Thursday, and would also, you know, once the electric telegraph came along, uh, could also be rapidly dispatched to America. So he had a huge audience over there. What was the, apart from his great oratorical skills, what made him so attractive? Um, I think he preached a, simple i mean it, it was the he was a purveyor of popular religion uh it was a a, a simple style of preaching uh which was uh concentrating on salvation the immediacy of salvation uh and also the the dangers of hellfire it has to be said he gets going in the 1850s which is a time of um crimean war uh, cholera epidemics uh you know the, the 1850s is a, a nasty unpleasant time and hellfire preaching obviously has its um, attractions and also you know salvation therefrom. And, and Spurgeon actually made a name for himself if I'm not mistaken by being an opponent of modern theology. He, yes. he, he saw himself as, as holding this, 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 this very strict older line. That's exactly right. You're referring to the downgrade controversy of 1887 to 88, which is one of the very interesting moments in late 19th century theology, where he stands for um, the, you know, a very traditional, very conservative view at a point when uh, the Baptist Union and many other uh, nonconformists, free church people, uh, were moving in a much more liberal line. And actually, he, he resigns from the Baptist Union uh, at the point of the downgrade controversy, which is a, he, it's called the downgrade controversy, perhaps, obviously, because um, 
he says that um, theology is being downgraded, that's where the term mm. comes from. And uh, he, he resigns at that point, which of course is a major blow for um, a major shock within nonconformity in Baptist circles in particular, because he is such a celebrity. But it's actually interesting that it's the, it's the next generation of Baptist leaders, John Clifford, for example, who was an Arminian and not a Calvinist, uh, who actually take over from, uh, from Spurgeon and become the leaders uh, within that denomination. So Spurgeon's uh, position on downgrade is a little bit, is a little bit analogous to the later fu original fundamentalists. They were going to concentrate on holding the fundamentals in America. Yeah, I think his, uh, the essential conservatism of his um, position is one of the things which has retained his popularity to this day because he is still a, a, a figure w uh, um, about whom there is enormous interest. In another video you made with me some time ago, you were talking about the great Anglican theologian F.D. Morris. Yes. And Morris is the first person who actually openly says a doctrine of eternal damnation is incompatible with uh, the, the loving God that is seen in Jesus Christ. And yet, here is Spurgeon, as we're using the hell fire mechanism, mm. which of course ha has certain, you know, it's, it's popular, it's, it's easy to grasp, it's, you know, it, it, it's the scare tactics of, of, you know, whenever, I always see, think that whenever a politician has run out of ideas, they, they run into a scare story. You know, oh, it's good. Now, the interesting thing is that F.D. Morris is a very thoughtful theologian mm. looking at fundamental problems and trying to come up with solutions. And he goes into oblivion. He's only known to academics. Spurgeon, and, and even in the 19th century, his influence is mainly within the academic community. Spurgeon is preaching this very unreflective uh, theology. Um, you know, it's a, late it's a late medieval way of preaching, though I know uh, Baptists tend not to want to know that hellfire preaching is Roman Catholic preaching after the Black Death, but that's where it comes from. And you have this strange phenomenon that here is Morris going into oblivion and Spurgeon being people saying, I want to go up to London, take in a show, and, in the, and, and the, the, the show is go yeah. and hear him preach. Yeah, and it, absolutely, very, very interesting. That's why I think they are a, a very interesting pair of uh, uh, theologians to consider together. And the uh, issue with Spurgeon actually is that um, he, his sermons continue to be pr uh, published on a, on a weekly basis up until 1917. So although he dies in 1892, um, he has, he's produced so much material that there is a kind of machine which keeps his, his ideas uh, being produced in mm. weekly instalments way after his death. So he has a very interesting post-mortem uh, life as well. There's almost a frightening thing that um, bad theology but very popular. It's, it's, almost yes. a, it's almost a sort of a, a, a finger wagging over us that often the most popular theology is, is, is often the least reflective. Yes, in, in defence of Spurgeon, he, he, was, okay. he wasn't an educated man, uh, but he was, uh, he was a big reader. He did, you know, he did read very widely. Uh, so he, you know, I think we want to provide a, you know, a, 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 try and provide a, a rounded sense of a man who was thoughtful, um, but obviously he, you know, he knew what he thought. Uh, there's a, am I mistaken, or did he have a theory that uh, beards and smoking were both uh, both well, religious activities he has his yes he has his redeeming features he did actually say not that i'm advocating smoking of course no, but no, he of did course actually not. he did actually say uh, that he smoked to the glory of god and he was also uh, when the temperance campaign which of course was enormous in the late 19th century he he did have to be persuaded by his associates that he would have to sign the pledge but he did so with a certain degree of reluctance. So he is usually depicted with a large fat cigar. It's a portly, portly gentleman with a large uh, beard and uh, usually holding a fat cigar. So he doesn't look like the austere um, cleric. You mentioned period. that his, his, his sermons were still being produced as late as 1917. How is he remembered today? 
I think he, well, uh, there is the Spurgeon's College in South London, which is the major um, educational institution for the Baptists in the United Kingdom and a very fine institution. Um, he, uh, th there are a lot of people who would see him as being a very important figure within the Baptist church. So he's seen as, uh, not, although not, uh, it's interesting that only very recently has a scholarly study of Spurgeon appeared. There have been a lot of very hag hagiographical, very uncritical studies of Spurgeon published in the past. But uh, just recently, Peter Morden has produced a scholarly study of Spurgeon. So he, he does, um, he does have um, uh, followers, both popular and also more reflective today. Francis, thank you very much. I hope that this introduction to Spurgeon has thrown up the interesting picture of a theologian, a preacher, whose preaching in the late 19th century could, become, could give him celebrity status, something that few Christian preachers today would even dream of uh, being a possibility for them. But also it does raise the interesting problem. Uh, Spurgeon preaches a very simple theology, and it's a theology that in a more reflective world, I think few today would agree with. Thank you very much. <laughs>